Maybe let's take a, a, a quick aside because you and I are speaking about this with such a degree of familiarity. I want to make sure the listener understands how you're measuring VO2 max in the lab. This is a test that I believe every human being, athlete and non-athlete, should have done because everybody needs to know their number and everybody needs to know where they stack up against people their age and their sex because, again, it is one of the most important, if not the most important, modifiable metric we have to speak to both the length and quality of life. So if I came into your lab tomorrow to have my VO2 max measured, tell me what we would do. So the good thing now, of course, is that also VO2 max is being, or let's say metabolic measurements are being democratized as well. There is, uh, for example, we work very closely with a Canadian company called uh, VO2 Master that allows you basically to put now a mask. So it's like, you know, the old age, basically, when you have these big uh, computer yep. towers and everything, today we have iPhones and Androids that basically have computational power that exceeds millions of times, even what the Apollo 11 expedition had. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. So the same thing is, of course, happening also to to the to the metabolic uh, let's say to to metabolic analyzers as well from basically being these huge towers that were basically exclusive to labs to basically where it's now being democratized and you basically have like this port super portable analyzer just sitting on your face meshing your basic your your oxygen uptake but to bring it to the lab setting and uh, what happens there is that you come into the laboratory setting uh, i don't work so much with relative values but a lot of people will do so obviously we're gonna we're gonna measure your weight so we get your weight there and as you just said you mentioned christian for, or let's say an elite athlete you said 80 milliliters per minute per kilogram so we have normalized this to, to, to kilogram and that's why we need to measure your weight so now when you're running, uh, so what we do is that depending on what kind of modality that's important to you, so let's say that it's, it's running, for example, what you'll do is that you get on a treadmill and basically there, there are a couple of different, let's say, ways to do this. Uh, it was, the, let's say the method is pretty much the same, but it can be a little bit of a different gear. Some people will use uh, something that we call mixing chamber system, and some people will use what we call breath-to-breath -breath systems. But it would basically involve basically you having either a mouthpiece in your mouth where there sits a uh, sits a uh, um, analyzer uh, or not an analyzer, but sits a turbine with a uh, uh, sample line from it. So basically, when you're exhaling in this mask there or through this mouthpiece, we are measuring the flow uh, or how much air you are breathing in and out per time as a function of uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, if it's a turbine, then basically we correlate it to how many how many RPMs this turbine is spinning. So now we know whether you are breathing, for example, 50 liters or 100 liters, 150 liters per, per, per minute. But then, of course, now we only measure your ventilation. We don't know anything about your oxygen consumption yet. We only know something about your ventilation. So then what we also have to do is we need a sample line that's, that sticks in there as well, that basically collects now the concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide as well. So what we then do is that because we know that the ambient ambient oxygen condition and ambient uh, ambient uh, CO, CO2 conditions is basically, let's say, 20.9% oxygen and then 0.05% CO2, more or less, speak, yeah, roughly speaking. While you are now running and you're breathing, you're obviously breathing in a certain amount of oxygen into your lungs, and then you're consuming some of, no, or, or let's say air into your lungs, which contains basically 20.9% oxygen. When that comes into your lungs, parts of that oxygen, far from all of it, actually only closer to 25% of that oxygen, you are actually, actually taking up in your lungs, and it's being now transported through your body, and you're exhaling actually 75%, roughly speaking, 75% oxygen, you actually exhale out again now. And then basically, since we are measuring now the oxygen concentration with this device, we can measure, we know now the delta concentration that sits between how much, what is the oxygen concentration when it goes in, how much is oxygen concentration that goes out. And since we also measure the volume of air, we know we can now extrapolate that and say, okay, this is the amount of oxygen you're actually extracting from there. And this is how we know your oxygen consumption. So why is oxygen consumption uh, important? Well, this comes back to basically calorimetry uh, and calorimetry actually it's very often th people think then immediately of nutrition and, and foods and these kind of things but it's actually just a unit 
is actually just a unit, a scientific unit, actually, for, for knowing how much energy is needed to heat water from, from, from 14 to 15 degrees, for example, a certain amount of that, and then how many how much calories is needed. So we could even use gasoline for this. But it basically comes back to the fire triangle. You need something to combust. You need oxygen and you need temperature. And basically, when we know, when you combust, there, there's a field, now I'm getting really nerdy here, but there's a field, so there's a field in biochemistry, uh, which is called, or actually not only biochem, yeah, well, biochemistry, about chemistry in general, which is called stoichiometry. So in stoichiometry, there we can basically look at how much, uh, so when we have, like you mentioned initially in the, in the call as well, you talk about hydrocarbons, for example, but let's say carbohydrate, car carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And then we know how many molecules or how many atoms there are of each of these in that molecule there. And then basically, when we want to convert this into ATPs, for example, then we are breaking this down. So for example, if you look at the glycolysis, we are taking, for example, glucose, which is C6H12O6, and we are breaking that down into two, uh, two uh, pyruvates, or basically C3, C3H5, O3, but we got two of them now. But in this process of releasing ATPs there, at the same time, what happens is also we are releasing hydrogen, uh, hydrogen ions. And this is actually when you feel a burning sensation in your muscles, this is actually, it's not the lactate, it's actually this that you are feeling in your muscles. Lactate is actually a super fuel. It's super, it is, it's a, if the muscles get access to both lactate and, and, and glucose, it will actually use lactate as a preferred source before even glucose. But then basically because C3H5O3 basically lacks one hydrogen molecule now, as long as you have an excess of this, then basically you're able to bind back that hydrogen molecule in there and you get C3H6O3, which is lactate molecule. We've got two of them. So you split one glucose molecules effectively now down to two lactate molecules. So this, so but then basically, when you're looking higher now, when you're looking now at the the energy yield here, basically we know that when you burn, when you convert, basically let's say from glucose to to lactate, for example, there is a certain amount of energy or joules that is released in this process. We can even say, okay, let's forget about even ATPs and make it even a little bit simpler. What is the potential joules that sits in a glucose molecule? And then when we split this glucose molecule, how many joules are we releasing in this process? And basically, because it says C3, or basically C6H12O6, we know there are six oxygen molecules there. And now we can actually calculate, or we can know actually from your oxygen consumption, because that's O2 molecules going in, and then there comes out CO2 molecules, or both O2 molecules, but also CO2 molecules. Mm -hmm. But what we can know now is that we can know exactly, because we can use stoichiometry, and we can basically calculate how many, how much joules has been now released in this process. And that ties back to VU2Mac. The more oxygen you are capable of turning around per time, the more calories, or let's say the more fats, proteins, carbohydrates, you are able to break down and release energy that you can use for forward propulsion in the process. And that's why VO2 measurement is, is a holy grail metric because it's we, we can always talk about direct calorimetry, but that's so, let's say, call it, intrusive into a process and so little um it's uh, practical to do so indirect calorimetry measured with vo2 max or vo2 and vo2 max is is a superior method to understand how much energy are you able to release in this process and also then just to come back a little bit to your field as well medicine if you have a low view to max, it basically means also at the moment you start to have stress in your lives, you have infections in your lives, anything like this, you are utilizing a much higher percentage of that ability to, 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 to because to get healthy as well, you need energy to get healthy as well, in, uh, as well, to, 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 yeah, to do whatever, transporting blood around in your body or whatever. Right. So, so basically an athlete that has a huge view to max that becomes sick, they will there's a fractional change basically or, or or a relatively small change of their capacity or reserve that is you or let's say utilized now in this process so at the moment they release basically their training or they 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 they, they reduce the training volume they get a huge excess of energy or or ability to recover now uh, and if you're quick enough to do it you won't almost get any effect or 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 um 
increase in infection at all because the body gets so much energy excess to help aid in the recovery process now compared to a person which has a solo view to max that even walking up the stairs start to 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 bring them to a level where they are even yeah trying yeah. to catch I, I, I think that's such a great point and i and i don't think people fully appreciate what a physiologic stress significant illness is. So, you know, again, I won't bore people with all of the details, but if you go and do the chemistry on what it takes to raise the body's temperature from 98 Fahrenheit to 103 Fahrenheit, that is an enormous energy cost. When you, you know, when we look at cardiac patients, when we look at any patients in the ICU and you look at the change in cardiac output that might be required to support um, a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, it, it is profound. So um, I think this is ab absolutely spot on and it really comes down to just having more reserve. Uh -huh.